Okay, I guess we'll get underway. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome again to Marquette University Law School, Eckstein Hall. I'm Mike Goucher, and this is On the Issues. This is our continuing series of conversations with news and policymakers, people who are doing interesting and important work in this region and beyond. Today, we are delighted to be joined by the Attorney General for the State of Wisconsin, Brad Schimmel. Won't you please give him a warm welcome to Marquette Law School. I think the last time I was talking to Brad Schimmel in this room was a, a debate in the, the race for time. Attorney General, the first debate in that race. And, uh, and since then, you, you've, you've gone from being the Waukesha County DA to being the Attorney General. And I think you've told me that it's, it's been a fascinating change. In, in, in what sense? Well, what do you like about this new job? You know, as Waukesha DA, I, I used to think I had the best job in government. I mean, I, my job was to come in every day and do the right thing. And, uh, and that's, a, that's a great blessing to go to work and be able to do what you believe to be the right thing every day. I'll tell you, coming to the, and I, and I was worried, frankly, coming to the AG's office that it might feel a little bureaucratic, a little administrative. Uh, compared State to- State government? Yeah, well, no. uh, right. <laughs> and compared to the DA's office where, you know, it's who got locked up last night mm -hmm. as a question every morning. Um, but nothing could be further from the truth. Every single day there is something exciting, um, often completely unpredictable that we're addressing. I, you know, I'll get off the elevator and there'll be somebody from my executive staff who's kind of waiting for me to step into the office because I need to see you for five minutes on something really big that's hitting today. Yeah. It's been fascinating. You've got a lot on your plate and, and I thought we'd take the next 45 minutes or so to, to walk through some of the, the, the big things that you're, you're doing right now as the state's attorney general. And uh, let's talk about the priority uh, yeah. you, you set out to address when you became Attorney General. You talked a lot about the heroin epidemic in the state of Wisconsin. I don't think that's too strong a word, epidemic. Absolutely not. Um, and also the problem of prescription painkiller abuse. Right. Uh, perhaps for, for this part of the discussion, give us a sense of your take on the magnitude of those problems. Well, this was my top priority as Waukesha County DA, and it was a natural top priority for me as Attorney General as well. Um, we've called this campaign we've launched the Dose of Reality. And I, that's where you have to start because that's what this is. And it's not just a dose of reality for citizens and in the public, it's a dose of reality for the medical community as well. And I'm very proud that we have strong partners in the Hospitals Association, the Medical Society, the Dental Association, the Pharmacy Society, the Nursing Association, and many more are all on board because they recognize that we all need to change our habits about prescription opiates. 70% of the people who are addicted to heroin got addicted to prescription pills first. Uh, and 70% of those people that, that, were abu are, that abuse the pills are getting them from a family member or a friend. That's a great opportunity for us if we can raise awareness on the dangers of addiction and and death from these drugs and, and well and destruction too. It's not just the people who have died, but it's also just the thousands and thousands of Wisconsinites who've seen their lives and their families destroyed from this addiction. We now see more people in Wisconsin die from opiate overdose deaths than motor vehicle crashes, more than breast cancer, more than handguns, um, certainly, and, and it's actually more than heroin and cocaine combined. And it's time for us to be aware of this, that, that the prescription opiates are the gateway drug. And so the Dose of Reality campaign sets out to attack the myths first that many people believe that this, this only happens to the bad kids. Well, back in the Waukesha DA's office, we had some years where in Waukesha County, we had 50 people die from accidental drug overdose deaths. And I met many of those parents along the way. And now it's hundreds and hundreds of parents I've met who buried their children. And I, I'm here to tell you, I learned all about these, these children from these parents. And I'm yet to find the parent who had the bad kid. Um, these are good kids. These are kids with promising futures so much, and we're losing them. And it's a huge economic cost to our state, as well as this health crisis. Um, we have to do something, and we have a great opportunity when 70% when of the people who are abusing the prescription drugs are getting them from family and friends that means if we can address 
the abuse and prevent the abuse of these drugs, we can knock out a big part of this problem. And when you talk about with 70% of the people addicted to heroin starting with the pills, that means if we can address the problem with the prescription painkillers, we might not have to talk about heroin in Wisconsin anymore. What kind of role does media play in helping you address well, this? Well, they're huge. They're delivering this message. And, and, and I should mention, too, that the, the media in every different form have been great partners as well because uh, newspapers, television, radio, they've all been more than willing to, uh, to, put this, to put discussions about this on the air. And uh, if you haven't seen these kind of discussions, you're not paying attention because they are out there. And uh, they're going to be out there a lot more because we're spending a lot of money to push this campaign out because this is something we cannot ignore anymore. You know, it's interesting. I think that, that uh, when you talk about heroin, which often is the end result of a, an addiction that began with prescription painkillers, uh, you talk about heroin, I think that there was for many years sort of this notion that that was a Oh, maybe that's a Milwaukee problem, that's a right. city problem, and it is a problem. I mean, in one week alone this summer, we had 20 heroin deaths yes. in the city of Milwaukee, one week. Um, but this is not just a city problem. This is a statewide 72-county problem. Oh, absolutely. There was a period of time, and, and I don't know if it's still true now, it might still be true now, where Marinette County, very, very rural county, um, was per capita leading the state in overdose deaths. What What is causing the explosion of this? Is it, is it illicit activity that's causing this? Is it just uh, the, the fact that prescription painkillers are so widely prescribed? Oh, what is it behind this? You know, it's frequently when I talk on this topic, I'll have 45 minutes or an hour to, yep. to talk about that issue. Let me see if I can boil this down to a few key things. One of the things is when it comes to prescription medications, um, they're not frightening. You know, you, you, if, if a pill is prescribed by a doctor to someone, how can it be deadly? How can it be addictive? Um, you know, if you, if you see your dad taking them and, well, your friend gets injured at school and doing sports or something, and, hey, you can help them be able to uh, get back on their feet quicker by sharing a couple of your dad's pills with them. Well, well, how can this be harmful? It's not frightening. And now it does get very, very, very frightening once people run out of the prescription painkillers and they're addicted because now they're going to look for heroin. Um, the heroin we have on our streets now is exponentially more powerful than it was even 20, 30 years ago. In, in the 1980s, the average heroin purity for sale on the streets was about 5%. We don't see 5% anymore. There have been some years where the average purity for sale on the streets in America was in excess of 50% pure. That means back in the day, 5% was heroin, 95% was an inert cutting agent to spread it out. But we don't get our heroin from Southeast and Southwest Asia anymore. We get it from south of the border. It's coming from the Mexican, Central American, South American drug cartels. And instead of having to smuggle it um, with some, by somebody swallowing a balloon or in their luggage on an airplane overseas, they can drive it across the border or carry it in a backpack. Uh, I'm wondering if, and, and I asked this of uh, Chief Flynn when he was here, you know, Milwaukee has seen this surge in, uh, in violence uh, in the last uh, about nine or ten months in particular. And, um, and I asked him, I said, you know, hey, Chief, do you think that the heroin business is driving some of this, that there are, there are you know, individuals who are warring over turf and business? Um, do you see any signs of that from your law enforcement perspective? Absolutely. I don't know how to quantify yeah. the, where this, uh, how much of this is due to the drug trafficking versus um, how much of it is, is did the disputes that unfortunately the Milwaukee Police Department sees ending in a deadly way all too often. Um, domestic violence is still a, um, a big source of homicides in Wisconsin. But certainly um, alcohol and other drug addictions always are lying in the, in the shadows Oh, and sometimes right out in the forefront when we have violence occurring. Bring us up to date. Uh, this past summer, uh, you and the chief and I think the mayor and the, and the district attorney got together and had a news conference and said, you know, we're going to work together to try and drive down these, uh, right. these uh, uh, growing homicide numbers. Bring us up to date on where that initiative stands right now. Well, we've still got a few, mis mis uh, few moving parts that we're putting together. Um, I'm still very optimistic that this can make a difference. I'm starting to get a little anxious that, 
that the pieces that need to be finalized need to get done very soon. We're about to hire, uh, we've actually completed the interviewing process for um, hiring the two assistant attorneys general who will be part of the, the gun prosecution team. We're ready to hire them as soon as uh, the other pieces are ready in place, but um, we're close. And, and I think we, it, the mayor and I talk with some frequency and we are still both committed to making sure that we make a difference for this. You know, this is, this is not just a Milwaukee problem. You know, it, it's their communities and uh, they're best suited to be able to address a lot of the issues. But from the state's perspective, Milwaukee is our biggest economic engine. It's our biggest city. It's, it's our flagship in many ways. And we certainly need to step in and do what we can. These, the people in the neighborhoods, and this is a relatively few neighborhoods where these homicides are occurring. The people in those neighborhoods deserve to be safe. They deserve to know their kids are safe going back and forth to school. I think I saw that you, you went on a, uh, uh, a ride with Milwaukee police, yeah. uh, not all that long ago, a few months ago or so, or how long ago was mm. that? Um, I lose track of time. It yeah. was probably four months ago. Yeah, and, and what did you learn from that by riding around in a squad car with the, with the cops? Well, you know, the thing that surprised me most was... Um, well, I'll start by saying what I, what I, the impression I went in with, because I've lived my whole life in the Milwaukee news media market, either in Milwaukee or Waukesha County. And you know, you turn on the news at night and you see every night there's 30 squad cars and police tape everywhere and a reporter telling you about another person that was gunned down. And it's always a street description that you recognize where these streets are. And I had some impressions about about what those neighborhoods were like, that turned out to be wrong. Uh, when I went out on that ride along, I spent time with the officers, um, going into a youth center, meeting a lot of kids who were really trying to find positive activities after school, avoid getting, getting dragged into negative activities. Um, and we met a lot, of, a lot of homeowners and residents that we talked with that night. Plainly, the vast majority of people in those neighborhoods are trying to have a safe place to go to work, a safe place to raise their kids, and, um, and, and that was what impressed me most about the ride along. So this initiative, uh, you said you're anxious. You, you, yeah. you want a sense of urgency. You, you, you're really ready to, these needs that you described, you'd like to see that we, happen quickly. We want to start collecting some scalps. We want to get trigger pullers and lock them up, and I want to get going on it. Uh, another uh, issue that you, you've been involved with uh, is, is the sex trafficking problem in Milwaukee, especially for, for younger folks. I mean, this, is, this has turned into a real business. Um, you announced a, a task force uh, a little over a week ago right. to address that. What, what are you hoping to do? What do you hope to change with this task force? You know, we, and we've actually been working on this since, since all the way back to uh, the beginning of the year, uh, working and at, at our... Um, uh, statewide uh, crime victim, uh, crime vic the, it's the State Crime Victim uh, Council. Okay. Excuse me, I couldn't, I, right. I get there's so many different names of committees <laughs> and things. Um, I just usually say CVC, <laughs> Crime Victim Council. And uh, we had a large gathering uh, of service providers from around the state that provide some type of services to, to people who are, who are victims of trafficking. And there are quite a few. The problem we had is nobody was communicating with each other. You know, one could hold a forum on it and none of the rest of them knew about it and this was happening a lot. The first thing we've got to do is make sure we know what services are available so that if you get a police officer who comes, or a social worker who comes in contact with a victim who wants help, wants to get out, we've got to provide them a stable place to go where they can count on us. Not just for tonight or for two nights, but long term because what happens is if that victim comes forward and we don't give them that confidence, they look at, they look at, this, at this unknown that we are and we're frightening. They can go back to the, to the known that was bad, but at least they knew what every day held for them. Um, we have to be able to provide that. Um, and that's the first thing we're working hard at the Crime Victim Council is to develop that resource um, collection. And, and it'll, and, so when a police officer has a victim, they can contact us and say, I, I, I've got a woman here who needs help. Where can we take her tonight? And we'll know where there's a vacancy and where we can get services to her. Um, the, uh, the, the cooperation that we've kicked off with the uh, Department of Family and Children 
families and children um, is addressing very specifically child sex trafficking. Um, but that's, that's a great place to start. I mean, it's, it's obvious the place where we should be most upset about this happening. And, uh, and many of the adults who are victims of trafficking started as children in it. So if we can, if we can nip that, we can, we can affect things long term with the adults. Describe for us, I asked you about the magnitude of the heroin and the prescription painkiller abuse problem. Describe for us the magnitude of the, the human trafficking, the, the sex trafficking of, of younger you know, it's a lot harder to measure um, because it is, it is a completely underground activity. I mean, we're, it, it surfaces only rarely um, that, we, that we know that's definitely what we have. But, you know, we know that when um, there was a lar very, very large cooperative effort between federal and state and local law enforcement uh, agencies, uh, just last year or two years ago, I'm, again, I lose track of time here, but um, when they did that nationwide sweep, Milwaukee came up as one of the biggest problems, one of the biggest sources of uh, trafficking victims. And some of those who are in the, who are involved in this business, who have, uh, who have been um, arrested and prosecuted for it, have described Milwaukee as, as kind of a mecca for it. You've got a couple of uh, big lawsuits your office is involved in. I want to spend a couple minutes on that. Let's talk about the, the, the first one for our purposes, and that is the... Uh, the president uh, and the EPA have come out with uh, what they call their clean power plan. This is a right. plan that would, uh, in an effort, I think the president believes, to address climate change, this would um, dramatically reduce carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, and it having a big impact on a state like Wisconsin, which I think about 60% of our electricity comes from coal. Right. Um, you're going to challenge that uh, in court. Uh, why? Well, first off, it's important to note that I'm a lawyer. I run a law firm, and I have a client. My client, the state of Wisconsin, wants us to challenge it. That's the first key thing. Um, and we have, we have a number of legal bases to, on which to challenge it. One is, constitutionally, um, the EPA has exceeded their authority. Congress gave them certain authority under the Clean Air Act, and to what they're doing now, our assertion is, is they are exceeding that authority and therefore, it's, it's not a lawful action. Secondly, it disproportionately harms Wisconsin. Um, and there are a number of different reasons why, and primarily because of the nature of our state. Um, we, have, uh, we, we have consistently been one of the top manufacturing states in America. Manufacturing needs reliable and affordable electrical energy. Um, right now, the only way we get that in Wisconsin is from coal. And the other, the other disproportionate impact on Wisconsin is our, our utilities in Wisconsin have for years now been investing huge amounts of money to upgrade our facilities. We have spent billions of dollars, in excess of $10 billion, upgrading our coal facilities here to clean coal. The way the EPA regulations have been written on the Clean Power Plan, we don't get any credit for the work we've already done. So when, they, when the president talks about a 32 percent increase, uh, excuse me, uh, improvement we need to see in carbon emissions by 2030. Um, that act, that's a meaningless number for Wisconsin because of where they started measuring. That's actually that's actually well in excess of 40 percent improvement we need to make in Wisconsin. And many of the experts in the field say that's just not even possible. And now here's the problem. The reason why we need to address this right now is because the utilities need to make decisions very soon. Not, not a year or two years from now, but very, very soon, because they don't, you don't build a power plant to, to have to change it in five years. You build a power plant with the expectation that that's going to operate for 40 years, and you're going to be able to recoup the investment over 40 years. Um, they have to get going. <coughs> And so we're, we need guidance from the courts about whether this is going to stand or not. The, the president's, uh, one of his arguments is that uh, this is good for people's health, um, that this uh, could dramatically reduce some uh, diseases that are, are perhaps uh, caused in part by exposure to certain things in the air. Um, does that matter to you as an attorney representing the state of Wisconsin as a client? I I've lived my whole life in Wisconsin. I love our environment here. I, I love our, our, our woods and our lakes, and, um, and I, I love the healthy lifestyle we have in Wisconsin. The, 
the problem with the president's argument is, is that what he's doing with coal-fired electricity generation in Wisconsin is a very, very minute impact on this overall carbon emissions problem. Automobiles emit far more. Um, and the problem we're going to face is manufacturing jobs are going to find, manufacturers are going to find it impossible to afford to do business in Wisconsin when their rates skyrocket. And by the way, some of we should be concerned about how are people on fixed incomes in Wisconsin. Some of us can afford to see our, our, um, our electric rates go up by double digits. People on fixed in incomes like seniors can't. And, but they're going to see that if this happens. Um, those manufacturing jobs are going to leave our state, and we're going to find more people unemployed. And those jobs aren't going next door to, Indi to Indiana or Illinois or Iowa or Minnesota or Michigan or even California. They're going to go to China and India, where they don't care about carbon emissions. They are pumping, they're pumping sulfur dioxide into the air. I don't know if anyone's ever seen photographs of people in Chinese cities walking around with face masks on because they can't breathe there. We, we've come a long way. We don't, we're not having problems with sulfur uh, dioxide emissions. And um, we have to do this in a way that makes sense. It doesn't destroy our economy along the way. So your argument will be overreach on the part of the federal government. Yes, that will that's, be the I mean, argument that's, in court. that's the constitutional argument we make. One is, is, is the overreach, and the other is the disproportionate impact on Wisconsin. Economic harm. Right. Okay. Uh, the other big lawsuit that you're involved with um, deals with uh, legislation passed by uh, our state legislature um, that says uh, we want to drug test um, people who are on, for example, the food share program, food stamps program. Mm -hmm. um, right now, I think the federal government says, well, you can't do that. Uh, you're going to challenge that. Uh, give us uh, some, some well, insight into what exactly you will be challenging. Well, or did it, I describe it that de accurately? It depends on what part of the federal code you read as to whether we can do it or not. This is the problem. Is, uh, uh, and, and, and as the state's lawyers, we, we did consult with the legislature and the governor's office as they examined this possibility. There are conflicting federal regulations, one that says the states shall not be prohibited from taking this type of action, and another one that says we can't. Um, ultimately, that's what courts do. They decide when there's a conflict of laws, and we're going to have to have the resolve there. What, what's the risk for the state in this? If the federal court, uh, federal court says, um, uh, no, you, you can't do that, um, are there potential consequences for the state? Or do things just continue sort of the way they are today with no drug testing? Well, I think they just continue with no drug testing. Um, if the state goes forward with the drug testing right now, we could see some federal payments to the state cut off. That's why we, we took proactive action to go to the federal courts now and ask for a ruling so that we don't get into that battle down the road. So let's find out what the, what, what the answer from the courts is, and then we'll follow it. I've got to ask you about the, uh, the John Doe investigation. I, I saw you were at an event, a, a WIS politics event, back a, a couple of weeks ago, and you were asked about this. And, and you made an interesting comment, a couple of interesting comments, uh, about the, the John Doe, and specifically the second phase of the John Doe, which looked at uh, alleged illegal campaign coordination between the governor's campaign and conservative groups. Uh, you called it an abuse of power. Why was it an abuse of power, in your opinion? Well, because we know now from the decision from the Wisconsin Supreme Court, as well as from federal courts, that um, the law violation that was being investigated wasn't a law violation. This, it, when, when you are going after something that's not a crime and using the criminal process for it, that's an abuse of power. Did they, uh, at the time, though, as they investigated, I guess the, the counter to that would be they didn't know if it was a crime. Well, and I think that's the argument. And a lot of, and a lot of folks have asked me, you know, are you going to go criminally charge people at the GAB? Are you going to go criminally charge people in the Milwaukee DA's office? And, you know, that's ultimately the answer was at the time um, that, they commenced, that they commenced the investigation, it wasn't as clear. Um, and I think given the fact that along the way they did have a judge who was signing search warrants and subpoenas, 
you know, that really makes the that really makes a criminal action against anyone like that very difficult. Uh, those close to the governor characterize it as a political witch hunt. I asked you back during the debate uh, about John Chisholm, somebody you know well from your days as a DA. Right. Do um, you think it was a political witch hunt knowing John Chisholm? You know, John and I have worked together um, over the years as assistant DAs in neighboring counties, as DAs in the two neighboring counties, and now as a DA in our largest county, I mean, as, me as AG, you know, he's one of the important partners on, the, um, on this gun violence right. issue. Yeah. And um, he has been a reliable partner with me on any public safety issue that we've addressed. And, um, you know, I think we'll be able to continue to do that. That didn't sound like you were answering that question about what you thought about John Chisholm's handling of that case, but anything you'd like to add to that? or? <laughs> I'm, as, as I did say in the Wisp Politics uh, <laughs> luncheon uh, gathering, I, I'm, I'm still learning how to answer, how to not answer questions in a way that no one notices that I didn't answer. <laughs> I think I noticed that one. That one uh, um, yeah, you also said, uh, and I did want to ask you about this, the, uh, um, you know, there's been this gag order, uh, which has been interesting to watch because information has sort of circulated out there, as we've all seen in media accounts. Um, and you said you don't think that's constitutional, the gag order in the John Doe. Absolutely. You, can't, you cannot order a citizen to, to not say anything to anyone about why all the police cars were at their house or why people came and searched their house. You can't do that. That's, that's not constitutional. There's no legal basis to do that. What needs to, lawmakers have made it clear, Republican lawmakers have said that you know, they want to change the John Doe law. You're a veteran, uh, uh, you know, uh, law enforcement guy. Um, my guess is you have uh, a greater degree of familiarity with John Doe's than, than many people. I've used them, yes. Yeah, yeah. And um, so what needs to be changed, if anything? And, and are you concerned as a law enforcement person that, that it ends up looking like we're changing the law simply to protect elected officials? And it will all pretty much apply to everybody else, but we're going to make sure we take care of elected officials. Um, Change is going to happen. Right. You know, what, whether, That's clear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, right out of the gates in January. Actually, I'm surprised that it didn't get done in the spring session of the legislature because uh, there was that much energy in January to get going on this. And, and there were original plans. Some were discussing, let's just blow it up altogether. Let's get rid of this as a tool. And we'll replace investigations with grand juries. Now, you could do that. But no state prosecutor in Wisconsin uses grand juries for anything right now. Um, and I'm not aware of anybody having done it in the recent past. Um, feds still do it in criminal cases in Wisconsin. We'd have to put that structure in place. But as I talked with the legislators, legislators who were pursuing that about this, you know, I pointed out you're concerned about the secrecy aspect. Well, grand juries are typically conducted in secret as well. Um, you're concerned about the ability to um, to obtain to obtain the basis to charge someone too too easily. Well, we've all heard the saying about you can indict a, gra a ham sandwich. Mm -hmm. um, you know, grand juries can be very much controlled by a prosecutor to make it to make an outcome that they want to see happen. Um, if they really want to charge somebody, they probably can do that. Um, I don't think that one is necessarily better than the other. Um, the John Doe system has been working. Prosecutors use it for many things, for arson investigations, for drug conspiracies, missing persons cases, um, homicides. We're able to put those things together um, effectively to do investigations in ways that we, you can't do when you just send police officers to knock on someone's door and see if they'll talk to you. Um, we can get information we otherwise don't get, and um, they're valuable to us. Um, when they get used for, for a political investigation, it, it, it never, you can't seem to avoid it becoming a political battle then. Um, what the legislature is, uh, it looks like they're going to propose, will likely involve some oversight so that um, a, a John Doe investigation cannot just go on for years that without someone taking a look and making sure that it's... Um, that it does meet constitutional standards, that it is investigating a proper law violation. Um, there's no proper law violation. It's properly investigating a law violation. 
Um, so I think, I think what they'll, we'll ultimately see is something that has appellate judges reviewing it periodically to make sure that, that there is a, it's a proper investigation. Um, and then also they may limit uh, what types of laws you can use, um, use the John Doe to investigate. I'm not concerned about that because that doesn't leave a prosecutor who wants to investigate impropriety by a public official without tools. We could use a grand jury. Mm -hmm. We can use standard investigation techniques. There are, there are other ways for us to pursue it. Um, so I, I'm pleased that, that it looks like we won't eliminate the tool for prosecutors altogether. As the state's uh, uh, top lawyer, uh, would it, am I overstating it by saying you would urge them to be careful in how they tweak the law or, or be, we, yes, would be I, careful? I would, and, and we've, you know, as they've talked about, what they're talking about now is making a list of statutes for which you may use the John Doe to investigate, and we've been, uh, we've been helping to add to that list, finding other, other crimes that we think should be added to that so you can use the, the uh, procedure to investigate those. Let's talk for a moment about open records, and, and this was a, an interesting story that developed right before the 4th of July holiday, and uh, news media accounts of um, uh, reporting that uh, certain lawmakers uh, were interested in changing the state's open records right. law, and, uh, and changing in a way that many communications by lawmakers would have been privileged. Essentially, the public would not have been able to see them. Uh, Big public uproar, media very unhappy about it. But it might be argued that your comments on this uh, sort of um, helped uh, kill that idea. You, you, you said you, know, you just didn't agree with that. You thought that was not a good idea. T tell us more about your, your thoughts on, on the open records law. Um, you know, when that announcement came about the 999 bill, I had just announced the, uh, the opening of our Office of Open Government at the Department of Justice. Um, we, had, we were a couple weeks away from our Open Government Summit where we were gonna take on you know, some difficult challenges in, in, uh, in the open government laws. And I have a special role in, under Wisconsin law as Attorney General. I, one of the responsibilities I have is to advise uh, local officials on on how to stay in compliance with public records and open meetings laws. Um, so when this got announced, and I was at Summerfest that night with my daughter mm -hmm. when it came out. Um, was your band playing? No, no uh, a friend of mine's son's <laughs> band was playing. Okay. Um, he plays bass in a rock and roll band, so that's, uh, <laughs> but that may take you off your point. Go, go um, you were at Summerfest when you found yeah, out. Yeah, and mm -hmm. you know, we decided, well, let's, Let's wait till tomorrow morning and let's talk about it. We, we discussed it Friday morning. And I really think given my special role in, uh, in the open government uh, sector in Wisconsin law, I just don't think there was any way that I could, um, I could not comment or make, take some kind of a, type of a stand on it. So, um, you know I, know, I know during the time as Attorney General, there'll be times that I'll, I'll disagree with uh, fellow members of my... Uh, my Republican political party. Um, we accepted that morning, this is one of those. And we just did it. I, didn't, I don't take any glee in it, but that's what we had to do. I was gonna ask you, uh, what was the reaction? I mean, this was proposed by a couple of uh, um, pretty prominent Republicans. Um, you're a Republican. I mean, what, what was the reaction to, to you taking a stand and saying, no, I don't think that's a good idea? Um, frankly, <laughs> Frankly, many legislators have uh, have approached me and uh, privately, yeah, and said uh, thank you. They appreciate it. They didn't want to vote on that thing. Um, it's, it's a fact of life. This is ultimately this got pulled out. It didn't get voted on. It didn't go anywhere. I am relieved for that. Um, we have an, we have a lingering problem as. And we're following up from our Open Government Summit trying to find some, some changes that we can get consensus for. And, and what happened there has caused some to, to have um, a large degree of caution about making any changes. And that's disappointing. It's gonna take us a little longer to, to find those consensus issues than I'd hoped. But 
we're going to keep moving forward and um, always keeping an eye on keeping Wisconsin government as open as we can. But when you talk about changes, what, what, what are you talking about in terms of what, what would know, be changes in the open records law? You know, our open government laws were passed in, I think it was 1981, maybe it was 83, but a long, long time ago. And um, the internet didn't exist. The, um, the idea of having a camera on a squad dashboard or on an officer's um, uh, yeah. shirt pocket, none of that was a possibility. Uh, emails didn't exist. It wasn't possible for a, uh, for a town supervisor to appear at a meeting via Skype. Um, and frankly, Skype's probably old already. I don't even know. Um, but uh, my daughters will correct me later. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, none of those things were a possibility. And we've, we've just had this series of starts and stops over the years as the courts have addressed the lawsuits and tried to give some guidance, but the guidance is always narrowly addressed to that specific case, and we're always still left with a lot of questions after that, and I think, we, I think there are some ways we could address some of this in a way that would give better guidance to public officials. But again, sort of a go slow approach on something like that? Well, it's, gonna, it, it's going to be slower now than we planned, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me wrap things up on my end, and then we'll take a few questions from the audience. And, and ask you about the nature of this job. Um, I used to talk about uh, this with uh, J.B. Van Hollen, your predecessor, and, and he used to say that, you know, being attorney general was a really tough job in the sense that certain people want you to do more, certain people want you to do less, yeah. certain people want you to take a more active stance in, in pushing uh, certain uh, law enforcement uh, policy. Uh, some people want you to take a very hands-off. You get it from all sides. Uh, as a Republican, you can get it from not just Democrats, but Republicans. You know, how, how have you dealt with that? Do, do you find that a, a challenging environment? Um, absolutely. Um, my communications director has a saying about this. Uh, um, she'll, when someone wants to ask me a question about a potential disagreement with, uh, say, the governor or a legislative leader to say, they want to hold your hat, hat while you punch, insert name of other person, or excuse me, hold your coat mm -hmm. while you punch them. And, uh, and I get that. And I get that it can be fun to try to draw a rift. Um, I'm working to solve problems. And um, I will not always agree 100% with everybody that's of the same political party, I will not always disagree with people who are in the Democratic Party. Um, I'm finding it, I can work together with a lot of different people on a lot of different ideas, especially public safety things, especially things that help the state's economy. Um, we're moving forward, and the, dis the distractions of that stuff, I, it doesn't slow me down that much. In a perfect world, would the Office of Attorney General be a nonpartisan office? You know, I, I think, I think that attorney general, district attorney, sheriff, um, those are positions that aren't really well suited for partisanship um, because in, in those jobs, you enforce the law. Um, you, don't, you don't, most of the time, you're not deciding what the good policy is. You're simply doing your job to enforce the policy that was enacted. You know, it's, it's always been puzzling to me that mayors, county board supervisors, are elected in nonpartisan elections when clearly, the work they do is, is partisan in nature. Mm -hmm. Let me take a few questions from, uh, from the audience. Uh, please raise your hand and we'll call on you. If you're in the seating bowl, press down on the rim, not on the button. Keep your finger down on the rim. We'll be able to hear you. If you're in the back, please wait for Ryan in the... Uh, how would you describe the color of your shirt, Ryan? Chartreuse. <laughs> okay. Day glow green shirt. Um, and wait for Ryan to come over so we can hear your questions. So please raise your hand if you have a question for Attorney General Schimmel. Yes, right here. You mentioned uh, your sex trafficking initiative and connecting service providers, social workers, law enforcement. I'm wondering how, in light of the fact that many citizens, including law enforcement, tend to believe that sex trafficking is a foreign issue, how do you plan to garner support and success with your sex trafficking initiative? There have, thank you for that question. Um, and that's an important issue. We, we will continue efforts to keep training 
um, law enforcement officers, social workers, um, district attorneys, judicial officials, uh, all of them um, to understand the nature of the problem that does exist. Um, uh, that, that's an important piece to it. Yes, go ahead. In this time of transition, what is the state doing to guarantee that folks who have voted in the past will be able to continue to vote with the new voter ID law and that coming up? I, I, I don't know what impediments um, there may be for, for people coming out and voting in these elections. We've had now, um, they've been small elections um, in, in more, more localized where we've had voter ID in place now and I haven't, I haven't heard of any problems yet. So hopefully it's going to continue that way. Hopefully there's going to be plenty of time before we have bigger statewide elections that uh, anyone who's, who wants to vote is going to be able to get things lined up so they have the right ID. I think I asked you about this a few months ago, but about voter ID. You consider that settled law now in the state of Wisconsin because we had somebody who's head of the ACLU's Voter Rights Project, Voting Rights Project, uh, Dale Ho at the law school, and he, he sort of intimated there still might be things that, that could come in terms of their challenging that law. How do you see the law right now There's, as it exists? Right now, yeah. um, the state of the Wisconsin's law stands. Um, we are still subject to, there are still some ongoing lawsuits, and, and that's, what, that's what litigants do. They continue to challenge things. We have some ongoing lawsuits, uh, one in particular that is addressing something that the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals didn't take up. Um, it didn't move on from the, uh, from the district court, so it's left unresolved as to whether um, uh, several types of additional IDs should be permitted for voting purposes. So um, with this, that's still in the works, but in general, in general, the law is moving forward. Okay, let's take other questions. Yes, sir, right in the middle. Um, thank you for your service, uh, Attorney Schimmel. I have a question regarding the addiction and I think the difference between heroin junkies and prescription pills is a matter of somatics, especially since some of the heroin addiction comes from the pain pills addiction. What does the state do to regulate or look into the doctors that write prescription pills, continue writing orders for prescription for uh, pain pills, and the person goes back to a doctor maybe once a year because of their health plan only paying for it once a year, by that time, many, many people get addicted and it's not helping their original medical issues. They're just addicted to the pain pills. What regulations or what do you do to see how many prescriptions that individual doctors write out for the same pills and what yeah. can you do about it? Thank you. you know, as, as, as we develop the, the Dose of Reality campaign, we, we were working with the medical community on this and, um, and there were a number of leaders in the medical community who, who said, this is perfect because we need the dose of reality more than anyone. And it is, and I've, I've, I started as, as DA, boy, two and a half years ago already, uh, talking with medical groups about the nature of this problem. And I found that in the medical community, they did not know um, in general, they did not know that the prescriptions they were writing were being diverted and that they were the source of the heroin addiction. This, this whole picture that I've painted today and I've been painting many times, they just weren't aware of it. Um, we're working very hard to get that dose of reality to them. Now there are doctors who have been writing prescriptions for profit and a number of them have been prosecuted. There are all these unintended consequences. That's how Marinette County ran into such a huge heroin problem because a uh, doctor in, um, uh, just across the border in Menominee, Michigan, was writing prescriptions for profit when, when state and federal authorities busted that doctor and locked him up. It left all of those pill addicts needing some place to turn and they went to heroin because heroin and prescription painkillers, the op opioid painkillers are the same. They're just one's, one is processed in a lab, one is processed in a legal drug plant, but ultimately, chemically, they're, they're essentially the same. Um, right now, our prescription drug monitoring program does not give us the ability to take a look at prescribing practices. The only thing we can do is look at a particular patient and see what prescriptions they've gotten. 
Uh, we are right now in the process of working to um, our, the contract with the prior um, uh, provider for that program is expiring and uh, we're, we're working on developing a new contract with a provider that's going to enable us, we hope, to um, be able to use the prescription drug monitoring program also to take a look at prescribing practices and find out are there, are there aberrant practices out there that, that perhaps hospital systems need to know about or, um, or law enforcement. That, that would be huge, I would imagine. We had um, Bridget Brennan, who is a special narcotics prosecutor in the, in the city of New York here. She's a Wisconsin yeah. person, and you may know her. And, and she was talking about that. That was the thing that they were finally able to get a handle on. Who were the doctors? Yeah. And, uh, and so that kind of information in terms of, of accomplishing the goals of your program, I, I would imagine, would be huge. Right. Yeah. But ultimately, with 70% with of the abused opioids coming from family and friends improperly, we can take a huge dent out of this without even having to talk about how doctors are prescribing. You know, one of the things that, um, one of the moving parts of the campaign involves um, materials that medical providers will be able to download for free from our website and, and print up, or we'll print them for them if they want, but um, one of the things that they can print up is an information brochure that we're hoping that every prescriber who issues a prescription for a prescription opioid will hand to that patient along with that prescription this information flyer that addresses the myths and gives, in, gives information to the, to the patient about the importance of using only as prescribed, the dangers of using improperly, the importance of storing the medications properly. You know, none of us would leave a loaded handgun sitting on our kitchen counter if we had teenagers coming in and out of the house all day, and yet very few people think twice about leaving prescription painkillers sitting in their medicine cabinet, and those painkillers kill a lot more people than handguns. Um, and then finally, the last thing is proper disposal. And we do have another drug take back day coming up on October 17th, where we'll be uh, statewide collecting um, prescription painkillers to incinerate them at, a, at an appropriate facility. Um, don't flush them down the toilet. Um, that, that puts them into our water supply. Water filtration systems aren't capable of removing most of those chemicals, and that can do real harm to us. Get them to us, and one of the things you can do on our website at DOJ, at doseofrealitywi.gov, go there and there's a spot where you can enter your zip code and you can find the closest medication return units where you can take your unused prescriptions right now and go turn them in at the police department. Dump them in to a, it's like the M1 Abrams version of a mailbox. They go in and only the law enforcement officers can get them out. They're not, you aren't gonna get asked questions about it. They're simply collected there so we can properly dispose of them. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes, right here. I was um, at the uh, Community Justice Council meeting this morning, and one of the concerns um, that the, uh, the people, the citizens there brought up was the unemployment in, in the city of Milwaukee. And one of the biggest factors, or one of the large factors, is having a record, having, having a criminal history. And I've known for years our expenditure expungement laws are very strict, and I was wondering what you, what you think, if there's room for improvement in the expungement laws, where you, you could see that balancing the community's safety, but also with being able to get people employed again. Um, in recent years, we did expand um, the expunction laws to, um, to raise that up to age 25, and, uh, and I think that's been a positive imp, uh, step in our society. You know, years ago when, um, when the circuit court automation program came into existence, um, it's a great tool. You can find out a lot of information. Um, you know, as a, as a father of, uh, of a 14-year-old who's starting to date, um, I'd be crazy when, to not go look up and see, you know? But, um, <laughs> but it actually turns out I might have other ways of finding things out. But, um, but with that information available, prosecutors should be much more cautious, should be much more cognizant of what happens when you charge someone with a crime because now you have created a record that will be on CCAP for 55 years. So you commit a retail theft when you're 17, your grandkids can look that up and find out. 
unless you get it expunged. And um, you know, I, I'd like to see, and I am actually, Representative Rob Hutton um, is working on a bill to make some changes that would include changing the, the expunction law so that you don't have to ask for it at the time of sentencing. Because you know, I, I saw it a lot as a prosecutor when a 17-year-old uh, you know, high school junior comes in, they're charged with possession of drug paraphernalia. The, um, you know, the offer is it'll be a $150 fine. He says, file fine. I'll just pay my fine and just be done with this. Well, you're not done with it because now that record sits there. You might become ineligible for government-backed student loans. You might not get into the college you want when they find it. You might not be able to rent an apartment and you might not get the job you want, and that the dad of that uh, young man or young lady you want to date might see it and, and give you grief. Um, we need to be very responsible about that, and, um, and, and I, so we've got to strike that balance. Um, one of the things Representative Hut, Hutton is uh, exploring is eliminating that requirement that you have to ask at the time of sentencing, that you could come back later when you've had some, some good years behind you and say to the judge, hey, I've, I've, I've done a lot of good things, judge, and here I am facing this challenge in my life that this is standing in the way of. So I'd like to see that loosened. Um, I, I've heard the same, the same kind of things asserted um, from, uh, from individuals in the community at meetings, too. Let me uh, take other questions, yes. Uh, General Schimmel, to your point on, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, prescription drugs in medicine cabinets at home. I happen to be a lifelong re residential real estate broker. I caution these days every single one of my sellers to yeah. secure their medications at home. Any real estate broker coming through to show a property, if they're being responsible, is going to be a close eye on that. Open houses are an invitation for thieves to come in and steal out of medicine cabinets. Has your office uh, in the past, or would you consider getting in touch with the Wisconsin Realtors Association and ask for their cooperation on this very point, because I'm sure you would get it from the thousands of members of the Wisconsin Realtors Association or, and, and make them aware and sensitive to this? Yep, that, that's a great suggestion. Um, I have heard that what you just described from many different real estate professionals who've approached me, they've said, you know, you used to just have to tell your, um, your clients, don't leave, a, don't leave a $100 bill or your credit card laying on the nightstand. Now you have to tell them, don't leave your medications in the cabinet because, you know, people who, are, who become addicted to opiates, um, they, their life becomes a series of lies. Um, they are constantly lying and manipulating to feed their habit, because the fear of the fear of withdrawals is terrifying, um, and um, therefore they become very, very good. The more you practice things, the better you become at it. And they fool their families, um, they fool their friends, they fool the real estate agent who's hosting the open house. They absolutely. That's a great suggestion. Thank you. Other questions. My understanding is that filtration systems have been developed for, for coal um, plants. And of the 10 million billion plus that Wisconsin spent to, quote, upgrade our coal facilities, was any of that in actual installation testing? The, I, I'm going to get outside of my my expertise if I go too far into talking about the technology of um, energy plant emissions. Um, I know that Wisconsin has made big investments and that most of our coal generation facilities in Wisconsin are what are called clean coal, which is a dramatic reduction in carbon emissions from those plants. Um, beyond that, um, I, I know that there's other technologies, technology that's been talked about. I've been told by the, the experts that we've consulted with that, um, that technologies that would make the dramatic reductions of in excess of 40% that the EPA would be requiring are not possible and, and, and in, term, in terms of cost effectiveness. It, it's just, 
it would wipe out our, our manufacturing sector in the state. Let me take a couple more questions and then we will uh, wrap things up. Uh, counties have struggled uh, with the recidivism issue on the uh, heroin. Yeah. Would you care to comment on that aspect of it, sir? You know, um, it was, it was a, a decade ago. I was an assistant DA um, assigned in the uh, Metro Drug Unit in Waukesha County. And we started, it was 2005, we started noticing heroin popping up in Brookfield and Delafield and McQuanago. And um, we couldn't believe it. We hadn't seen heroin in, in our communities in, eight, in, in decades. And we started looking at what happened. And our first reaction was, we're going we're gonna to approach this as a, as a public safety law enforcement problem. And we're going to go out and we're going to arrest our way out of this. And um, it didn't work um, for a couple of reasons. One is that um, a, uh, you used to be able, on the, with the cocaine problem, the, the crack cocaine problem, there were typically drug houses. You could find out where the person bought the drugs. You'd go get a search warrant for that place, find a lot of drugs, arrest some drug dealers, and you could, you could clean it up. There, aren't, there are no drug houses anymore. Or if there are, they're, they're a cell phone and, and, a, and an automobile. Because you, you, call the, you call the heroin dealer on a throwaway cell phone that the dealer has. They meet you in a restaurant parking lot, give you your drugs. We found very quickly it was a lot harder to go after the drug dealers. And we also found very quickly that the volume of people addicted made it impossible to approach it that way. And then this addiction is different than other addictions we've dealt with because it's so much more powerful. We found out that you, know, you could put somebody in the, in the county jail for 45 days and they would come out and they would go right back to using. I mean, almost as fast as they got out the door. Um, I know anecdotally from, uh, from some users that they always kept $20 on them, and when they got booked into the jail, they had the $20 so that when they got out, they could go buy right away. Um, we've even had people we've put in prison for a long period of time um, because, of, because of a heroin issue, and they've come out unchanged. We're doing things smarter now. We are. We're making much more expanded, and we're still working to expand this even further, the use of drug treatment courts. Um, ideally, I'd love to see people get in treatment and get, and get healthy again before we have them in the criminal justice system, but often they're landing in our, with us. And when they are now, we're using drug treatment courts as a means to help them develop the tools to stay sober and to, uh, to be able to resist um, relapse. Drug treatment courts work because they're not like the old probation. First off, standard probation can't monitor you as much as drug treatment courts can. We live in your back pocket in drug treatment courts, and in a good way, in a supportive way. I remember the very first staffing I went to for a, uh, uh, it was an alcohol treatment court, when we opened that in Waukesha County, and they're talking with the, the person who's addicted to alcohol, and. Um, they discovered that uh, her cat had died that week. And the staffing team said, well, okay, we've got to up uh, her monitoring this week. Bring her in for a couple other, uh, couple more alcohol tests and more meetings with her case manager. I said, wait a minute. Why do you people care about her cat dying? Well, the answer is simple. That's a stressful time in her life when she's more likely to return to the addiction. Those are the kinds of things that treatment courts do. They are focusing on the person, the challenges in their life, lives, and then trying to address them and it constantly adjusting how we're monitoring. And when you, you earn your way to more freedom, when you make mistakes, we don't revoke you like probation does and send you off to jail or prison. Instead, you may have a consequence that may involve a night in the jail, but instead, we don't kick you out of the program. We step you back. We, we increase your monitoring a little bit, and we let you earn your way back up. And it's kind of a, a leapfrogging process all the way to the end. But by after about a year and a half, um, the evidence is demonstrating to us that people come out healthier, and they come out able to, able to have long-term success against their addiction. I think I'm going to wrap things up there. Uh, before we go today, I'd like to say uh, thanks to everybody who was here today for their uh, time and their interest and their 
their attention. And, uh, and I just wanted to also mention that our next uh, on the issues event will be a week from today. Charles Franklin, the director of the Marquette Law School poll, will be here uh, with our newest poll results. And this will be the first poll, I think, done in the state uh, since the governor announced that he's ending his presidential campaign. So that should be a, a good event. And uh, also, check uh, all of our events on the on the issue series on our website, law.marquette.edu. We'll be adding a couple of more here in the next week or so. Uh, again, thank you for your interest today. And most of all, thanks thank to you. the Attorney General. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.